Okay, our next speaker is uh, Scott Smeltz. He is a uh, okay, he's a he's a new PhD student at Cornell University. Uh, Scott today will be speaking about uh, seascape modeling of benthic habitat disturbance from commercial fishing activities. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Scott Smeltz. Like you said, I'm a new PhD student at, at Cornell. Uh, this is a project that I've been working on uh, with some really great collaborators. Brad Harris, uh, Alaska Pacific University, John Olson from NIMS at NOAA, and Suresh Sethi, uh, a faculty member at Cornell University. And so, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, seascape scale modeling of benthic habitat disturbance <clears throat> from commercial fishing activities. And basically, what I'm going to do is talk about a quantitative approach to um, modeling disturbance, but also how that fits into a management framework. And uh, initially, I was going to prep you guys and say, well, this is, you know, quite a departure from a lot of other talks you've probably seen this week. I mean, we're going to talk about marine systems um, and work up in Alaska. But then I saw this last talk, and I'm like, wow, this is exactly what we're doing. We're taking work like that, looking at things like anchor stars, in our case, stars and trawls, and kind of blowing this up to a bigger picture, to a bigger scale. Uh, and so, you know, just to give you an idea of the, the habitat we're talking about here, um, we, we talk a lot about habitat features, and these are the features that give structure to the benthic environment. Uh, these could be things like uh, geological features, like just simple sand ripples or piles of cobbles, or biological features uh, like uh, COC webs, um, corals, uh, and, you know, things like that. Things that provide, you know, uh, cover or forage opportunities for fish species. Um, and now, at the federal, uh, you know, marine level, as far as management goes, there is a framework for considering habitat, and that's what they call a central fish habitat, or EFH. Um, now, every managed stock at the, you know, federal level uh, marine species has a designated EFH. So, for example, uh, Pollock, Alaska Pollock, up in Alaska, this thatched area is the EFH for Pollock. And what comes with that? is this legal mandate that habitat disturbs the EFH, um, and that could be from you know, fishing activities or development, um, cannot be more than minimal and not temporary. And yes, that is a double negative, it's also a very vague um, kind of mandate. And so I'll get back to that, about how we can uh, approach this vague, this vague language with a quantitative approach. Um, and so, just to give you an idea of kind of where we've come from, there have been other, uh, other models, other quantitative models out there to, to, to look at the uh, habitat disturbance for commercial fishing activities. In particular, two I'll mention here is the Long-Term Effects Index, or the LEI model, which was developed by Steve Fujioka and implemented by the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. Um, I'm going to talk about council a little bit. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with the, the council system. There's eight different councils across the U.S. that manage different federal fisheries. And so the North Pacific one in particular manages the uh, um, Alaska fisheries. And so this LEI model was <coughs> adopted by the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council for their 2005 and 2010 reviews on EFH. Uh, here on the East Coast uh, was the swept area seabeds Swept Area Seabed Impacts Model, or the SASI model, um, which was adopted by the New England Fisheries Management Council in 2010. And as far as I know, none of the other eight councils have any good uh, quantitative approach to uh, managing uh, or dealing with uh, habitat disturbance for fishing. And so we wanted to add to the acronym SOUP, so we came up with the FE model, or the Fishing Effects Model. And there's two characteristics in particular I'm going to point out. Uh, about that you can think about as we go forward here. Number one, we track habitat disturbance as a proportion of total area, and we move through the model in discrete monthly time steps. So basically, we have an output of how much habitat is disturbed every month that we run the model. And this has been adopted by the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. I must have a great purpose. When I wrote this, it was actually December of 2016 when it was adopted by the Fisheries Management Council up in North Pacific. And so this here is a big 30,000 kind of look at how the model runs and the basic inputs for it. Number one, we need to know where fishing is happening. <coughs> we need to know what type of gear, in particular how big the gear is, that where the fishing is happening. 
Uh, we also need to know, so even though gear is deployed, it's not always in contact with, with the bottom. That's what we're most concerned about. We need to know how much that gear actually contacts the bottom once it's deployed. And then we need to know how susceptible the actual benthic features we're concerned about are to being contacted with that gear. Now, one problem we have is we don't actually know the distribution of these benthic habitat features. So what we use is sediment as a proxy for where these features are located. Now combine all of this side becomes impacts to the habitat. We also um, consider recovery to make impact as well. But of course, once a disturbance stops, then things start to recover. I highlight these in red because they were the parameters involved with these two uh, components were part of a very large comprehensive um, <clears throat> review on impacts and recovery conducted by Grabowski et al. for the SASE model that I had mentioned earlier. Um, this is really just a really more colorful version of the last slide. What I want to point out in particular is this right here. So basically what we do is we consider the world as either disturbed or undisturbed. Impacts basically convert the world or you know, a specific piece of real estate from undisturbed to disturbed and recovery takes it the other way. So basically that's how the model runs through time. Um, a couple of cool things I want to point out. Uh, now we do not have do we not have distribution of habitat features at the start of this project? We have distribution of sediment throughout the North Pacific. Uh, so we sifted through NOAA's databases and archives and found every place that they have a description of sediment ended up being over you know 200,000 points described over 6,000 different ways. And we condensed that into five sediment classes for our model: mud, sand, granule, pebble, cobble, and boulder, and basically make distribution maps for each of those five sediment categories so we can input into our model. And then um, also our model works on five kilometer grid cells. So this just gives you a sense of that scale and kind of what that size is compared to the whole domain. Our whole domain is the uh, EEZ, the 200 mile radius of you know, exclusive economic activity for uh, US vessels. Um, and then also, just to give you an idea of kind of where fishing is actually happening, this is all fishing tracks since 2003 overlaid on this grid, and about 20% of these grids, these grid cells have at least some, you know, touch of fishing since 2003. Um, I'll also point out uh, this kind of contour here. Ooh. This contour here, uh, kind of, that's the edge of the continental shelf where water gets much deeper, so for all intents and purposes, Fishing happens at depths less than 1,000 meters. So when I show you the results in the next slide, it's kind of cropping this EEZ to everything less than 1,000 meter depth. And so here is the um, <clears throat> here is uh, the output from the model. It's both spatially explicit, as you can see down here, and produces a nice time series of what we call habitat reduction, which is the aggregation of habitat disturbance within all of those grid cells. Um, there's many different ways we can run this model. This one's kind of run just using all gear types um, and all kind of habitat features, considering the impact of all of them kind of in aggregate. Uh, just point out a couple things. As you can see here in this red, that's kind of the hot spot of, of trolling. They call it Cod Alley. It's kind of where the most disturbance is happening. Um, <clears throat> you can see kind of the effects of some of uh, marine protected areas, in particular this big one here and here, and also to some extent out, extent out here in the Gulf of Alaska. These are areas uh, where trawling is not allowed to occur. Um, and then up here in the time series plot, uh, you can see number one, uh, the effects of uh, the seasonality of fishing. There's an A and a B season. Um, and the most important thing though I want to point out here is right about 2010, uh, the habitat reduction start to really drop off. And the reason, there's two reasons for that happening. First of all, in 2010, there was what's called Amendment 80, which was a rationalization of the ground fish fleet, which basically led to uh, less effort for the same amount of fish. Uh, and also at the same time was an uh, <clears throat> introduction uh, of, of gear modifications to the ground, ground fish fleet. And so, uh, whereas they used to have to tow, where they would tow these big nets across the bottom, basically the foot, foot rope would just drag and scratch across the, the sea floor, they would now have to have, kind of, I'll some pictures later, of some lifting elements that basically um, rise that ground rope, that foot rope, just a little bit off the sea floor so it doesn't actually contact the sea floor, which can have a tremendous 
positive impact on uh, habitat, uh, reducing habitat damage. So going back to this more than minimal and temporary language, um, again, this, this model, this outcome was adopted by the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council to get at you know, this language in particular. So a work group was formed to say, how can we use the output from this model to actually kind of say, is, more, is the damage more than minimal, not temporary? And so what we came up with was, for each EFH in the North Pacific, number one, does the total, um, does the total habitat reduction exceed 10%? That's kind of one threshold. The second threshold is the disturbance time trend negatively correlated with life history parameters. I put a star by it negatively because it's not necessarily a statistical sense, but um, does maybe a reduction in habitat correspond with the reduction in some parameter that indicates uh, poor fish health? Um, and so this becomes now a new kind of method to identify a problem. And what's really nice about this is prior to you know, this method here, the only thing we had to identify a potential problem might be occurring is if the stock fell below the minimum stock size threshold. That was the only way we could say, hey, there's a problem, maybe it's habitat related. Now let's give this kind of alternate route to be proactive about potential habitat uh, issues associated with different stocks. Um, so this, the outputs of this model have just now been disseminated to the different stock authors to deal with. We had one particular who kind of signed up to be an example and to see how this workflow is going to play out. So Martin Dorn, who works with the Pacific Ocean Perch in the Gulf of Alaska. The Gulf of Alaska is this body of water here in South Alaska. And so basically what you see up here is the output of our model clipped to the EFH of Pacific Ocean Perch. Uh, so down here you see a time trend since 2003 of habitat reduction. Uh, the red is Pacific Ocean Perch. The goal, uh, dashed line is kind of Gulf of Alaska at large. So number one, you see it's slightly elevated compared to the Gulf of Alaska at large. That is, there's a little bit more habitat reduction there. Um, but also it's well below that 10% threshold where it's like you know, between one to 2% here. He also took uh, parameters from his stock models, the stock assessment models, and he compared it you know, uh, a kind of correlation analysis, simple correlation analysis to this time trend here. And, you know, it's not really important that these are, but the main thing to take home is that none of these were really correlated uh, with this time trend. So in this case, in Pacific Ocean Perch, based on the thresholds that have been kind of set, uh, they would say no, there's no evidence of a habitat issues for that, for that stock. Um, so we're going to continue working on this model, continue to try and prove it. One of the first things we're going to try and do is make sure this aligns with anything that's happening in the real world. So we're piggybacking on some uh, work to look at the distribution of corals, sea whips, and um, sponges. Some cameras were deployed out of the Bering Sea to look at where they are and if there's evidence, you know, actually looking, you can see broken ones from fishing activity. Um, and what we found here, uh, basically this x-axis is kind of groupings of our predicted disturbance to habitat. And on the y-axis here is you know, evidence of actual disturbance to these features. And you can see there is some agreement uh, that where we kind of predict more disturbance, there actually is observed, more observed disturbance. Um, and also, we're going to try and use this model, uh, again, for, for, for management purposes, to run some uh, simulations. Uh, number one, uh, the biggest one is to see what is the effectiveness, at least from a habitat standpoint, of uh, MPA or spatial closures. So all throughout Alaska, there's a whole bunch of spatial closures, way more that I can't keep track of, um, that are there for various purposes. The one purpose that they're often put in place is to protect habitat. But the question is, how effective are they compared to simply um, implementing gear modifications like this? So these are like lifting elements, and just simply uh, lifting uh, the gears a little bit off the seafloor reduces that contact, and in some cases, it can have just as much positive effect on habitat as a spatial closure. Um, I'd like to thank you to our, our primary funders, the, the Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future, um, the Groundfish Forum, and NOAA Fisheries. I think this is a really great collaboration between you know. Uh, Organization for Sustainability, industry folks, uh, federal folks, uh, bring us all together to be concerned 
about, uh, as the last presenter said, these things that you can't even see are easily forgotten about on the sea floor or even in freshwater systems. The, you know, the bending habitat is often forgotten about. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions that you guys have.